21 Grams is back, and welcome to the third iteration of our show. And in this iteration, we are offering a a one-on-one interview with indie artists, and we're going to examine three very specific aspects of the creative soul. The cerebral, which will be all about the chess moves and deep thoughts that go into the aspects of the work and creating the work. The emotional, which will be all about the investment the artist has made in the work and creating it. And the practical, which will all be about the application of common practices, tropes, and ideas. That being said, I'm your host, Joe Compton, and let's get deep into it. Here now is a new episode of 21 Grams. Hello, everybody, and welcome to 21 Grams. I am your host, Joe Compton, and look who I brought in. Look what the cat dragged in. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, Mr. Lar. How are you? Wonderful. How are you? I'm good. Everybody, Ron Lar. If you don't know who he is, that's crazy because you should. If you're any any fan of anything, uh, Nita says hello. Uh, But uh, Nita, tell everybody for those who just might be possibly running into this is their first introduction to Go Indie now, and they haven't seen what you do for us and everything. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself just to get it out of the way. Sure. Uh, I, my involvement with Go Indie Now, I host uh, Mean Reviews, No Stars Given, which is uh, designed to promote indie books and movies, um, but in a different way because, you know, there's there's lots of interview shows. And so we, we take a different tack and uh, mm-hmm. try and be funny and entertaining and, you know, promote the books that way. And then I also have hosted and, and hope to host again uh, Indie Mayhem, uh, the the game show where all the contestants are indie creators, either writers mostly, or musicians, or people related with the, to, to film. And I mean, we've had like uh, people who do uh, voices for audiobooks, you know, yeah. uh, that kind of stuff. And that's also supposed to be fun and entertaining um so i like to do different types of shows um and and then i also write i write fantasy science fiction humor uh and then besides that mostly i garden Garden yeah he says she's here to heckle so i believe it Yeah, and uh, I don't know if you saw, but you know, Mengel's here. He says hello. Hello. Good evening. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm curious because this is my first opportunity that we've ever had to have a one-on-one. I, I love when – I mean, I did this earlier with Maddie in the season, and now I get to do it with another host who I know very well. I mean, we're we're good friends, and we know each other. Indeed. But but I uh, – I haven't had this opportunity to do it on camera in a one-on-one setting with you. I mean, we've we've had one-on-one opportunities like on New Year's Eve and stuff like that, but we were drinking, and I don't even remember half of the things we were doing. No, I drank a lot. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to kind of get an idea and a sense of what is it about writing for you? When did writing become a part of your life, and why did why did you gravitate to fiction writing? Well, uh, I learned to read, you know, very, very young, uh, before uh, kindergarten. Loved reading, always, you know, my whole life. Uh, And very young age, started writing, like most people, really bad stuff, you know, in grade (laughs) school. Um, But by the time I was in high school, I was writing stuff I liked that Mm. I, I still think is, has some quality to it. Um, and most of it was funny. Um, and I got lots of attention for it, which, you know, who do, well, positive attention. Who doesn't like positive attention? Nah. And I knew I wanted to do that for a living. Uh, but then, then I had a baby. So 
um, I had I had to feed that thing <laughs> and clothe it. Damn baby. Uh, so, you know, and then uh, I had another one like eight years later. So, you know, 30 years down the road, I was like, yes, I should get back to writing because the kids are all gone. Um, but I, yeah, I knew from from high school, I, I wanted that to be the case. Now, I did. I didn't just write humor, but I did recognize that I wanted to have some life experience, you know, that sure. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to write the great American novel as a teenager. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I've got all that out of the way. All my life experience is done. Now I can just write. <laughs> and Nikki is right. Um, they do. And I have worn that that very thing to my daughter that just had a child but as per usual she doesn't believe anything i say so. <laughs> well that's awesome i i love i love hearing that writers continue the passion well beyond you know what normally people would think is where you start you know and it, it's because the cool thing about writing is you can start at any point and you and you wrote, probably were still writing you just weren't professionally or you know publishing what you were writing right so you were always probably dabbling from time to time i uh i of course i did a lot of writing um for work yeah uh and uh and some of that work was in politics so it was still fiction um, <laughs> but uh i and i and i still wrote you know on the side you know yeah. fiction stuff um in particular i I rewrote things um, mm. and kept working on them, but it might be months between spells of writing, you know, because just life. I mean, especially mm. kids, you're driving them everywhere and you have to go to their awful dance recitals or <laughs> plays, you know, and I mean, my youngest played tennis. And so we would just be sitting outside for hours waiting for her to play. You know, I mean, it was uh it was very time consuming having mm -hmm. children. Um, although I enjoyed it, mm -hmm. I guess. You know, so you're you're unique to the to this show in the fact. Well, you're unique because you're Ron Lar, but you you're unique in in a different guest for me in that you've not only done solitary writing, but you've done you know collaborative writing and published both and. And you're working on a full-on anthology collaboration with the, within your own world that you started as a solitary writer. Uh, yes. And I'm kind of curious how you feel about both aspects. What, what what do you like about the solitary versus the collaboration and vice versa? What do you like about the collaboration versus the solitary? I prefer the collaboration. Do you? Um the it's so easy to get bogged down you know writing mm -hmm. um and i mean for example this anthology i'm i'm writing my own stories for it but then i'm editing everybody's for making sure it fits into my fantasy world so it's a sure. fantasy there's a fantasy trilogy the fourth book are short stories that uh friends are writing uh, mm -hmm. in my world. So it's, I mean, when I get one or even just talk to one of them about the fact that they're working on one, man, does it perk me up? I mean, it, it is, it is just so exciting. Mm -hmm. And I experience the same thing when I'm writing either a story or, or a, a novel with somebody just, man, you, I mean, every time they write something awesome, you're like, Oh my God, that's so great. You know, I mean, it's, it's just very powerful, a real rush. And, and just, uh, it definitely keeps you motivated because you, 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 no matter how busy you are with everything else in your life, you know, you can't let that other person down mm -hmm. and, or you ought not to let the other person down. Um, so I, and it, it, it just, yeah, it's very rewarding, very exciting. Um, and, and I've done a lot of different types of collaborating. So, uh, an interesting one was we each took a turn writing a page. I mean, and this was in the olden timey days where we had a typewriter, 
and you would type a page and then pull it out and hand it to the other guy and you'd be like oh, and you read it <laughs> and then you had to deal with whatever was in it um now it didn't make for the first draft uh, there was a lot of rewriting involved there but some great yeah, ideas came out of it. I mean, it was it was it was so fun i mean yeah. we, that's what we did for fun and um yeah so i i love collaborating if if anybody watching wants to collaborate i'm in i'll do it um and yeah i i mean you can't help it sometimes ideas come up and they're just you know something you have to do you know yeah. a short story or something and you it just comes out and you're done but yeah i would it would not bother me if i never wrote something alone again even though i have like 15 books planned um if somebody was like i want to participate with you i'd be like let's do it because yes. I, I think it, it they'd be done quicker and i would have more fun doing it now i know there are horror stories of people you know collaborating and and i'm lucky i haven't had that happen mm -hmm. um and hopefully i didn't just jinx it well you you kind of though you kind of did though i mean for people who don't know, uh, you get what you steal. The the genesis of it, the beginning of it, you and RJ <laughs> were in high school together, writing something, you know, similar if not the same idea, uh, and you guys kind of parted ways and came back together, and then this this idea came together. I mean, that is true. As children, we were idiots. I mean, I'll give you that, you know, as teenagers, we were idiots, which, you know, fairly common. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but, but again, the looking at the entire process of it, it was a dream. I mean, yeah. it was so fun to do. And the fact that we had a couple of disagreements because we were stupid kids uh, is, I mean, pales in comparison to all the, the pleasure. Yeah, and of course we're working on, you know, I think, three sequels to it right now and hopefully more so what what gets what gets you more excited what gets you more motivated is it when you read something that makes you laugh or is it something that you like that you know captures your imagination more you know is it i mean especially with the, the catholic stuff do you feel like you are more engaged when somebody nails your world more or are you more engaged when somebody makes you laugh? Ooh. I'm more engaged when they would nail the, the world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, right now, so there is one humorous story coming um, and that I know of for sure. Um, but the rest of them haven't been there. There's a, there's a horror story that just takes place in a fantasy setting. Uh, there's, um, you know, more a more romance story that takes place just with a fantasy setting. And and then there's a uh, the one I just was working on editing is just classic fantasy taking place. And the 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 most fulfilling part is all the things they want to have happen in the world that I haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. you know yet and which is insane because i have a giant binder of just things i've written about the world you know yeah. and and yet they'll be like well what about this or they don't even ask they'll just write it in their story and then i have to go oh is that something that exists in my world i mean you know these these stories are going to be canon you know so i mean um so that's been fun and nice. just just the uh, i i guess it's even though I'm creating this world and it's completely, you know, wide open, I, you only think about so many things. And mm. so every other author that's come in and, and brings all these ideas up has been eye opening, I guess, and, and exciting. I mean, exhilarating. I, I hate editing in, you know, my own work. Yeah. I hate it. Uh, it's it's the only part of writing that is work and and yet doing it on this anthology is is fun and i'm doing you know line edit but also developmental editing sure. um because it has to mesh into the world sure and it is so fun 
I mean, I'm like, God, if editing my own work was this fun, yeah, yeah. I would enjoy we, it way we, more. <laughs> uh, we do have a question in the audience, and I, I want to get into Cathaldi a lot because we don't get to talk about it very often, and I'd like to, I'd like to sure. really delve into it. But uh, Al Mendel wants to know how you deal with the diff voice differences in, with a collaboration. Rewriting, you know, uh, uh, it. I mean, I will say that in the example you brought up before with Robin, uh, you know, we had very similar senses of humor. You know, we bonded yeah. over our love of Weird Al Yankovic you know, yeah. <laughs> in high school, which is a huge chick magnet. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, so, you know, we love Monty Python. We loved all we, we loved all these yeah. similar the things. Same, the similar, TV. similar taste in humor. Yeah. And so it wasn't it wasn't so hard. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have another friend that I've written with, and he's incredibly funny and, and smart and awesome. But we don't have similar senses of humor. Um, and yet you just you rewrite it and you, you know, you think you talk it over. What what is you know, we can see these two different sides of the character. What are we going to do about that? I mean, it's just it, like everything. It's all about communication, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And Nikki said um, that's what worries her is that she doesn't know if my voice is going to work. I'm just going for it and seeing what happens. Well, because Nikki is writing a story for the anthology, and she has made the protagonist of the original trilogy the protagonist of her story. So it's very, I haven't seen any of it yet, but I'm, it's so exciting uh, because I can't wait to see what she does. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I mean, I have great respect for her writing uh, ability, and yeah, I love everything of hers I've written or I've read so far. So I'm very excited to see what she's written. And I, I mean, I'm not worried about it, especially somebody who has done so much. Um, I mean, it's kind of similar with the Sherlock Holmes stuff. Mm -hmm. With, I mean, that's taking a, a character everybody knows, and I would, I mean, and such a beloved character. I mean, that's that feels risky. Um, so was Cathaldi always going to be a trilogy in your mind or did you did that yes. evolve yeah no the story uh when it came um you know it kind of like um it, it fully formed not fleshed out but the the outline of the story was such that yeah i knew it had to be a trilogy Mm -hmm. But I also knew there were a lot of other stories I wanted to tell in that world. I mean, my dream would be I have like five different series going at the same time. You know, yeah. that I I have the you get what you steal stuff. I have, you know, some fantasy, some some science fiction. But uh oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Uh <laughs> yay. Thanks. We're breaking we're news right it. here on Go Indie Now. I love it. Yeah, I love very good, you know very I good love news for me. News. <laughs> so, uh, but I spent many years working on the first one mm -hmm. because of the kid thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and also because, as you know, I when I originally wrote it, it was, it was like serious fantasy. It was mm -hmm. epic fantasy and... Uh, Dirk, who is the the main character now, was not the main character. He was in the book, yeah. Uh, but but a different character was the main character. It was very, I mean, Dirk still made some funny comments, but the main character is so he his name's Thylos. He's so earnest and good. And I read the book at the end of it, and I was just like, ugh. I mean, it was I liked it. I didn't love it. it I just thought it was kind of boring. And so I messed with that for many years, trying to get get it to somewhere that I liked it. And mm -hmm. and then when I started writing it, instead of third person with Dylos as the main character, first person with Dirk, then I was having a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. and in, but until I had the first book redone that way, um, I didn't even. Yeah, I didn't write a word for the second and third one. I mean, I had lots of notes mm. in files, but I didn't. I didn't actually like uh, do an outline for them or an, anything. Mm. It, it. It was. I try and stay focused as much as possible mm. on the work in pro 
and not worry too much about the future, even though it's so tantalizing. It's like a trick your brain plays on you. You know, yeah. like, oh, you're you're having trouble with this scene? Why don't you think about three other books you, yeah. know, you could write? And <laughs> so I I really try not to succumb to that. Yeah. No, that's a common thing. I, I I'm curious. You know, you mentioned that it started as a standard fantasy fair. Um, was that was that developed from your re reader brain that reading so much fantasy you wanted to mimic, you know, the the tropes and the the the, the idea of a fan of a true fantasy world? And was it was it the injection of humor that changed that for you? Because I would imagine because. For you, you're a naturally funny, gifted guy. You have a gift of gab. You're funny. You you you're very you're very sharp, and and it's very apparent in you. You get what you steal. I mean, your voice is all over that one. But was that the case? Was you were you searching for your voice to and was Dirk the voice that you needed? To, that, oh, yeah, that definitely. Change? I I mean, I love fantasy. Even though I've read plenty of, of humorous fantasy, um, not plenty, some humorous fantasy, you know, growing up, the vast majority of it is is not particularly Sorry. funny. Yeah. And yeah. uh and I love it all. I mean, I you know, I mean I Lord of the Rings, I read when I was really young and have read it many times since then. And I mean I, I it didn't even occur to me to make humorous fantasy because mm -hmm. the vast majority of it is is just straightforward right you know um and i love epic fantasy i mean i like most kinds of fantasy but i yeah i wanted to write just a i mean i knew the story and it was not particularly funny that you know the the story itself uh, i mean you know just these i mean a lot of <laughs> yeah a religious conflict hilarious uh but <laughs> Um, oh yeah, and until I started having Dirk tell the story, and Dirk is just, you know, an unreliable narrator and, yeah. and really <laughs> full of himself and, uh, you know, just a smart ass. So then it was a lot of fun yeah. and I, I probably would never have put it out if I hadn't, I mean, accidentally tried that. It was, it was almost like an exercise. Well, what if I start mm. bringing up, you know. There was a story I heard about Brian Eno producing a Stevie Nicks song. And in it, he brings for there's a version of the song where he brings forward the triangle. Mm -hmm. And Stevie Nicks would tell this story about how great Brian Eno was. Mm -hmm. And Brian Eno, I read I read an interview with him and he's like, Yeah, but the thing Stevie doesn't tell people is that version sucked. <laughs> and, but it inspired me. I was like, oh, what if I start bringing forward these other characters to tell the story, you know, from in first person? Mm -hmm. And Dirk happened to be who I picked first. And I was like, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm sticking with him. It inspired uh, the uh, cowbell sketch from SNL, that, that story. That's how I know yeah, the story. Because exactly. I was wondering where that came from. Because they used Blue Oyster Cult in that, in that, in that, in that skit. But it actually came from Fleetwood Mac and, and, and them figuring that that particular version out, right? So, so a lot of good came from it, even yeah, though it was exactly. Long was, yeah. or that we we got of, introduced to Christopher Walken as Christopher Walken for sure. I mean, that was uh, that was his coming out for sure, you know. But yeah, and and Will Ferrell, of course, and everything else that came with that, and and the ridiculousness of music producing music, which. I relate to wholeheartedly, but uh, anyway, <laughs> but I, I digress. Uh, you know, so it, it is, it's one of the hardest things I think for young or starting writers to really figure out is that you have a voice and if you don't trust that voice, it's never going to work. And that's the hardest thing to do is find the voice. And then once you find it, you know, you spend the rest of your career second guessing your own voice and going, have I written this before? <laughs> have I done this before? Right. And, and then you kind of get into it and go, well, you know, what? I'm just going to stick with what works because it worked. Right. So, and, and, and so there's a trust thing and, you know, 
you have that natural humor and I just figured that that probably where it shifted for you. Well, definitely a, a good friend of mine, uh, said he, he's interested in being a writer and we, we met each other through, excuse me, other things mm -hmm. and became friends. And then he confided in me, you know, that he wanted to write and that he had, he was taking these classes online and, and one was about that. He's like, you know, they're, they're like, you have to find your voice. And he's like, I read children of Catholic and he's like, man, that's not your problem. You know, you, <laughs> you've got a really, you know, unique voice in this book. Yeah. And, uh, uh you know, and uh, part of it, I think is what, why you're writing, you know, what you want to do. And, and I'm fortunate in that while I would love to make millions of dollars as a writer, mm -hmm. I don't have to, you know, I mean, I do it because I love doing it and, yeah. uh, and I write things I want to write yeah. and I don't work on something I don't want to work on, you know, um, like, uh, uh, yeah, you know, there's all the, if you, if you want to make money, write x you know the yeah. advice you hear from people right right yeah. romance novels right children's yeah. books right whatever and and i'm like hey if i right want a job i'll get a job you know i mean i have a, i have a career i could go back to that makes good money i don't yeah. i don't want to do that i'm i want to do something i love and yeah. and the shows i love doing the you know uh, yeah, I I want to have fun. I mean, I'm freaking in my fifties. I mm. I I had no fun while I had children. Now I feel like I'm due. Do some do some fun. You're due for some fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How much of Dirk is is in you? Uh, how much of you is in Dirk? How much do you? Well, uh... I'm not a sexist. <laughs> he, <laughs> he is. <laughs> um so you know yeah i treated my mother with respect and and my wives at different times you know i, I don't have multiple wives i've been married yeah but there's got to be subtleties that i would imagine are very similar i still think it's funny mm -hmm. the things he says i mean you know so i mean he's Ugh, that's a toughie <laughs> um yes there are things that pop into my head that I should say, and I don't. And like Dirk just says them. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, you know, there's a, a lot. I mean, I don't think I, ooh, maybe he's more like my teenage self. Um, <laughs> not that I was sexist, but, but I would Jordan. say <laughs> a lot more rude things yeah. uh, as a youngster that now I don't. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I think I'm a good person, you know, I, take care of my parents and I, uh, but you know, yeah, he's, he's your Tyler Durden basically. <laughs> yes. That, that is, that is Nikki. Nikki nails it again. I mean, that, that's a great way to look at it. Like yeah. if I didn't care about hurting people's feelings, uh, yeah. and you know, because I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm like a, I mean, sure. I'm a jerk, <laughs> you bet. but I try and keep it inside. You know, mm. uh, most of the time. Is there a character you gravitate toward in the Cataldi series, or even in uh, "You Get What You Steal"? That is, is you know, based upon you, or more like you? Oh no, more like me than Dirk? Uh, no. Um, yeah, no. I, I mean, of all the characters I have, he would be the most like me. Mm. Yeah. So. Okay. Just I keep it under control. Mm -hmm. I think. What when you when you approach people who have absorbed this right uh, absorbed this series and want to write something for it, or you know are interested in writing for it and you then give them the series and they absorb it, I'm curious what characters do you often do you have one character where they go I want to write it and that you just have so many stories about that you kind of had to kind of curtail a little bit and say can you pick a different character. No, because it's so wide open. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm like, write whatever you want. Um, and, and of course, I want, I want people who read the, 
the anthology to go read the work of the people who are contributing. So I'm like, sure. write thing right in your, that is you, your, so yeah. that when they go read your other stuff, they're not like, what the hell is this? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. so my friend who writes horror, write horror, um, just put it in in the world. And he did it really cool. He It takes place in the time frame of Children of Cataldi while the characters are in this particular town, like on the other side of the street. It's happening at the exact same time. If the characters in my book or his story turned and looked the other way, they'd see each other. And I think that is really awesome because, of course, more than one thing is happening in the world, you know, at a time. Yeah. And I, I just, I just love the the idea of that, that, that almost you could write a million stories taking place on the same day, you know, in this world. And so I really enjoyed that. But um, because of that, people are, um, I mean, most of them, I will say, are not using characters from the trilogy. Um, they're using places, the you know, except the gods. I mean, they use uh, the gods is coming up a lot. Um, so, and one guy wrote a, a story that where the gods are the characters. Um, and that was really neat because I had not thought about that at all at that point. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, I, so far it's been, the diversity has been awesome. Nice. Well, Nikki wants to know which character do you wish you could be more like? Uh, well, mm, ooh, nobody in You Get What You Steal. <laughs> <laughs> They're just too ridiculous. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, I don't know. Thylos is a good guy. He's just so fucking boring. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if I would want to be anybody but Dirk. I mean, I mean, there's definitely smarter characters and, but I mean, he's, he's good at heart. You know, he's like the, the jerk hero, you know, mm -hmm. the, or asshole heroes, what I normally say. <laughs> um, Cause I was telling somebody. He's Jack was, Burton basically. <laughs> well, I was telling somebody about, you know, what I've done to help my, mm. my mother. And they were like, uh, you know, surprised that i was like <laughs> surprised that i would do that because it has been extensive and and not to pat myself on the back but i mean they were just surprised the extent of what i had done to change my life to help my parents and and i'm like yeah i'm an asshole hero you know we're a rare breed um and i think dirk is that although he's more asshole than than i am i think <laughs> i think i don't know we'd have to ask my wives probably <laughs> in the world building process are you are you a fan of the world building process do you like the aspect I love of it. putting it together? i love what it uh it? yeah go ahead well, i was just gonna say uh for cathaldi man ton of world building yeah know? i would and, imagine you have three books and 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 so many more planned and so much information that i know about the world um mm -hmm. with with uh you get what you steal um it was a lot less yeah um it was a, it was very much a, a a bare bones you know this is what the universe is like and then we'll just see what happens and of course the way we wrote it uh, you know um went well with that you know you could just do anything on your page i mean we weren't trying to screw each other you know uh, yeah but there there was a lot more freedom there it's more yeah it but i love the world build part of it especially for fantasy and i i mean i i could do that you know for multiple series i would i would very much enjoy it because in in mine in cathaldi the race and religion are big things and they're you know sort of heavy things mm -hmm. um it would be to, to develop a world that wasn't focused on those things. I look forward to it. I mean, I plan to do it. So, 
what what aspect of of your world in uh in Cathaldi, and i guess we could do this for you, you get what you still do but what aspect of the world do you feel like you really nailed hmm Well, well, I don't know. I mean, that I think I nailed it all. It's just fucking perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean the the. I guess the religious struggle. I mean, I I enjoy that part, and I don't know if I like it so much because I think it's very different. You know, the 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 question that popped into my head one day that led to the whole thing was. You know what what would atheists do if there was proof that god existed would they be like okay great now i worship you or would they be like fuck you you know mm -hmm. that's insulting so i i was just wondering about that what would happen there if there was just no way to deny that god was real and then of course it filtered into a, a fantasy setting and um it turns out they would not care for it in my <laughs> so so uh um so you know i mean i i think that works i mean you know it, it doesn't you don't get all the information till through you know the end of the third book and there's more even than that to come mm -hmm. in future works but uh yeah i think i think i made well yeah, I don't want to spoil certain things, but I, I think I made a reasonable motivation for that that group of people. So Cathaldi's a true fantasy. You get what you steal, I would consider a true science fiction. Uh, I mean, there's elements of fantasy in it, but it's really true. I think it's more science fiction. It, it's more of space opera-esque. Yeah, space that. opera. Real light on the science. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah I, of course. But, I, yeah. but it's science fiction in the way that, uh, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is science fiction. I mean, even probably even less than that because there's a lot there's a lot of exposition that happens in Hitchhiker's Guide. But, but I would I'm curious, did you feel like there wasn't a different way to approach? The two genres do you feel like they're they're very similar in the way that you would approach it in your writing style or do you feel like there's something vastly different between the two that that you enjoy was there one that you enjoyed more because of that i don't think of them as very different mm -hmm. just because they're my two favorite things to read mm -hmm. you know i mean fiction i i mean i enjoy i enjoy humorous work as well but a lot of that is nonfiction, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, and mock mockumentary so, fiction, basically. <laughs> well, but like I love reading, you know, Tina Fey's Bossy Pants, you know, yeah, and yeah. and um, but but for for fiction, you know, escapist literature, science fiction, fantasy, those, those are my favorites, and so I don't think of them as very different, except for setting. Mm -hmm. um it, i mean and there's such you know wide ranging differences mm -hmm. uh and and when i say science fiction fiction i'm including you know all the subgenres mm -hmm. i i read yeah. most of that stuff um but yeah i i don't think of it as any different um i just think i mean for me it's you know what is the story that we're telling and and then uh working with robin of course you know we we had to do something we we both wanted and you know agree on those those things i mean if i would have written you get what you steal by myself it would be an incredibly different book <laughs> you know i mean obviously we we were we were you know switching every other page i mean we were both intricately involved in everything i think there was mm -hmm. one scene where he or one chapter that he wrote by himself because he he came up with it wrote the whole thing and then just brought it to me and i added some things into it but 
in you know. Please don't tell me that's the poll. That's the poll chapter. <laughs> no, no, it was not. Um, but ninety nine percent of it, we were going back and forth. You know, we were both there in in every, you know, chapter, every scene, mm. and that made it different. Of course, mm-hmm. you know, and, course. but the uh, the way I see it isn't any different. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I, you know, in in you get what you steal in in terms of uh, the one thing that I really appreciate about the art your art artistry is your you pay homage to a lot of different things, different tropes, different you know series, different you know nerd stuff that nerds would get. Um, just but you do it in a subtle way. Are you are you consciously thinking about those those nods and those homages, or are are they are they just product of you naturally because you you've absorbed it naturally, putting that into the the page you're writing? Almost always, I'm aware of it. Mm. Uh, but there are times where somebody will read it and go, "Oh, that's blah blah blah," and I'm like, "Oh." Uh, so I mean, you know, some sneak in. For yeah. sure, and I don't, I don't plan ahead. Oh, in scene or this chapter, I'm gonna, you know, pay homage to this or whatever. Yeah. yeah, it. But as I'm writing it, it, it just pops into my head, and I'm like, oh, that would be, you know, either funny or interesting, mm-hmm. or fun, just fun to write. Definitely. Mm-hmm. You you mix you mix and match uh, things too that I I find like like there's. There's a there's a Star Wars, but there's also an Ice Pirates kind of feel to the gang, right? And and so and then there's a Spaceballs feel to the gang, right? So you kind of you you was that also something that you you like to do? You like to blend it so that it that it does feel you can feel the homage, but you can also that more just happened, you know. Yeah. Like I said, we were like, okay, we we each when um. For You Get What You Steal, I had read uh, the book Partners in Wonder by Harlan Ellison, where he <laughs> talked about all these collaborations he had done and, and the uh-huh. different ways they'd written. So I'm like, hey, Robin, we should write a story. And, um, you know, we settle on science fiction and we each created a character. I created Clint, the, <laughs> the, the green donut alien, you know, on the cover. He created Leif. Um, and then along with Leif, his girlfriend, Doris. And so we had our, our main characters. We had our basic plot, mm-hmm. um, which was very basic. Uh, I mean, <laughs> not very fleshed out at all. And, um, and then everything else just happened as we wrote. I mean, and particularly that first draft, you know, I mean, it was, it was like being high we weren't high or drunk while we were working i mean it was very much just you know but but it, the energy and the i mean so we both worked but we would we would write hours when we weren't you know on the days that we worked and then the days that we didn't work it was all day i mean it was exhausting but energizing it was so yeah stuff just came out and but, you know, so you you type up a page, you hand it to the other guy, and he'd read it and be like, "Hey, that's a great, you know, homage or reference," yeah. and uh, and it it had just come out. You know, I mean, it wasn't planned. And then a few times there was discussion of things beforehand, but boy, not very often. Mm. I mean, it really all just was organic and. Came were out. you guys were you guys getting each other's references a lot? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, I see what you did here. I I like this. This is exactly this is... yeah. And yeah. and so that that was more how it happened yeah. than planning. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. That 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 opens up a lot of uh, for me. <laughs> but we weren't. It wasn't like we were trying to one up each other. Or no, no, no. To I, get I, them in. Yeah. It but really it, just it's happened. more like a kismet thing. It's more like um, it's yes. more like watching a band put like a baseline and a, and a rhythm together and, and kind of mesh the two together and figure out how they work together in harmony in that respect. 
that makes sense. <laughs> All right. Well, so we'll I've we'll never go. heard music. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I've never, I've never been around. Well, not never. I haven't been around a lot of people making, yeah. or you know, writing songs or or making music a little bit when I was younger. But because mm-hmm. I, I did have some friends who had bands. I didn't, you know. I understand. Uh, you know, so y- y- you put yourself out there and were very daring to do a self-help, not self-help book uh, in tongue in cheek. And, and, uh, and it's very much raw and it's, it's a lot of you, I would assume, you know, in terms of the humor and the, the tone and everything like that and, and the cadence and, and, and was that just, was that a confidence booster? Was that you trying to figure something out? Where did that Where did that genesis come from? So, I get married very young, uh, and and at fifteen years, my my ex wife is like, I'm done with that. I'm done with being married to you. So she leaves, and I I keep the house. I keep the kids. She was just like going through her midlife crisis and and she just wanted out so she leaves and i start dating uh and i'm dating this lady and she would say you know you do not understand women a lot <laughs> like like every day and i said you know that is that is ridiculous i'm like a genius when at, at understanding women you know i have a great relationship with my mom and my two daughters you know, my ex-wife and I had a great relate, or we still have a good relationship. I said, yeah, I'm like a genius at talking to women. And so I wrote the book to win that argument. Because I'm like, <laughs> if you're having an argument about something and you've written a book on that, I mean, you should win, right? Like, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. So I start writing the book. And at the time for work, I traveled a lot. Um, most weeks, like three out of every four weeks, I would fly to a client's site on a Sunday and come back late Friday night. Uh, so I'm at a hotel all week and I'm like, well, I don't just want to play video games or something, watch TV. Uh, you know, this would be great. I'll actually being, be being productive. Mm. And uh, I start writing it and it, what came out was nothing like what I had planned in terms of tone. I mean, Zach is the character writing this self-help book and giving yeah. me advice. And he's like Dirk turned up to 11 in terms of badness. I mean, this guy is so horrible, prejudiced, about, I mean, in every way. I mean, at one point, he, yeah, he, oh, yeah, he, he does not think much of women and, and in awful ways. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he's just an awful person. So then as so i mean i would guess like within 15 minutes of starting writing i was like well this is no longer me winning an argument you know now this has taken on a, a totally different uh purpose uh you know now it's just supposed to be funny and i wrote i wrote a bunch of stuff and then eventually i stopped and it mm-hmm. was done um so i don't know i mean i've had some some people who really liked it Mm-hmm. And I've had some people who very much did not like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of um, what you want when you had go for something like that, right? That's kind yeah, of it's the response you're eliciting. Definitely no lukewarm. Uh, yeah, you don't want anybody in the middle. That would be that would be disastrous. Yeah. Yeah that 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 would be just it's boring. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but or, um, or somebody goes, I get it. Whatever. <laughs> there's a lot of. Zach appealing to the women reading the book. Yeah. To 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 do I things. See. And I I got an email from a lady and and she loved it. She loved the book. And she was like, I had this book so much. I almost did send you a picture. You know, like he's encouraging women to send naked pictures of themselves. And I said, I'm so glad you did not do that. <laughs> you know, right. That was just a joke. <laughs> Please don't send me any pictures of yourself. Um, but, I mean, she still had enough good sense not to do it. But yeah. the fact that she wanted to do it, I I took it as a great compliment. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, 
because yeah, nobody should ever do that. Just send naked pictures of themselves to some author. You kind of bring up what I wanted to talk about next, which was, you know, there's a there's a danger with being funny and and having the kind of humor that you have, and that is you can go over the top. You could, you could be misconstrued. You could be misrepresented. There's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity to um, misinterpret what your intent is in a lot of respect. And so I'm curious in that respect, is, is authenticity the important element that, that binds that together for you? Do you feel like uh, being authentic is, or being, you know, uh, being something that is relatable is, is that where the, the bridge comes for you in in that respect or do you think it's something else well i don't have much that i wouldn't joke about my wife will be like don't do it don't you know ron (laughs) stop (laughs) um but i'm like you know what i mean to me if you if you don't have hate in your heart for anybody you know or no matter who they are or what they do and i don't i i then i i don't see the harm in making jokes i certainly make a ton of jokes at my own expense yeah all the time i and and i have no problem with other people making jokes at my expense i would like to think everybody would have that same attitude i know that is not the case um and but boy somebody well, you know, I mean, Dave Chappelle, when he recently hosted Saturday Night Live, I thought his uh, opening monologue was awesome. And he was making jokes about Jewish people being in the entertainment industry. But I did not find it anti-Semitic. I did not find anything he said hateful or hurtful. I thought it was funny. So I was quite surprised at the hullabaloo that came out after mm. that, um, yeah. and, you know, where people were saying it was anti-Semitic and hurtful. And I thought, man, that, I, I just don't see it. So obviously I'm, I'm at one extreme of the spectrum in that regard. I don't believe in, in canceling people unless they are hateful. I mean, mm. there was a couple of, God, what was it? I think it was um, Gilbert Gottfried when he was, doing the uh the the duck the aflac voice mm-hmm. in the and and they made a joke about the t- tsunami in japan like the day of and they <laughs> dropped him and i was like that was a funny joke uh so you know yeah obviously i'm at i'm, <laughs> I'm at one yeah. of the spectrum um, so could... but no i don't worry about it if i get canceled you know i can handle that mm-hmm. but but i mean is there a certain like something you kind of mix in there to kind of quell it a little bit to kind of to kind of blend it with a story? I mean, you could tell jokes. You you could tell jokes. You could be a stand up comedian, but the good stand up comedians find a way to find a rhythm, find find a balance, and and there is story even in guys like Mitch Hedberg and Anthony Jeselnik who tell one line uh-huh. jokes. They do hook you with a story and an idea that kind of sell the joke is that kind of how you look at it as well well i mean i guess all i care about is is it funny and like anthony jesselnik i love him i mean he has had just some you know where he he's like this is the dead be part of the show you know <laughs> you know i'm like that guy's for me um <laughs> And some of his stuff is very mean. Yeah, I mean, it is not just funny. So, although I hope I, I hope I'm I'm not being as mean as he is. Um, I still think it's fine, and I'm a big fan. So, I don't I don't know. Mm. I mean, I, I don't think so. Mm. I think I'm just like whatever, mm. whatever happens. Mm, if yeah. if I think it's funny more likely than not that i'm I'm going to just say it or write it or you know nice i like that that's 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 being authentic in a lot of ways and i think I that's, you that's using your voice thing. too right i mean that's using your voice yeah. and that's important you know 
Uh, and Nikki says satire is not for the stupid. It's a dangerous game to play. Absolutely. So. Ugh, yeah. That was very <laughs> true. Uh, I, so, you know, you, you've been doing a lot of hosting for us at Goni now. You've been, and you've been um, awesome at, at, at this aspect of it. What, what has it done for you creatively? What do you feel like has it given you that you didn't have before doing it? Well, I would say it's given me three things. One, the first was just my sanity because uh, I was, you know, with the pandemic, mm. I, I sold my house, moved in with, with my parents, my wife and I moved in with my parents and, it, and it's been very rough because my mom has severe Alzheimer's and and then the, the strain that uh, puts on my dad makes him lash out sometimes mm. um, and, you know, he's, he's just so stressed. And that's fine. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm here to help uh, and, and, and it, it's great, but it is, it's a lot. I mean, it's stressful. And then being stuck at home all the time, because one, I didn't want to get sick and I definitely didn't want to give anything to them, even though I ended up doing it. I don't even know how, because I'm like totally paranoid. Ma I still wear my mask all the time. I went to Costco and a grocery store today, wore my mask, saw one other person wearing a mask <laughs> out of everybody. Um, but, I, you know, I don't want to get them sick. Anyway, it was it was depressing and, and tough, and I was just stuck in it. I mm. couldn't leave. You know, I could go out to the garden, but I couldn't leave. And so participating, and and at first, for a long time, it just as a guest on different shows. Yeah. Uh, but getting to meet everybody, like Nikki and, and Anita and Maddie, you, I mean, all these people, that was such a lifesaver for me. Mm. Um, so that was that was huge first. Uh, the second thing was, um, I was not in a place to be doing a lot of writing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like sit alone and write, just acclimating to the situation. So I got to have fun and still be creative in, I mean, you know, doing a half an hour game show is a lot easier than writing a novel, you know? So, I mean... I would get an episode done and I would have so much fun and I would feel creative and, you know, we're writing questions for it. And so that, that was huge. Um, it was bite-sized chunks of creative time that I, when I couldn't do anything more mm. um, and anything longer than that. And then the third thing, of course, is just meeting everybody and uh, not only have I got to experience some awesome books to read, uh, because of course you can't meet another author and be like, oh, I, you know, and like them and be like, well, I got to read their stuff, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. or without being that way. So I've very much enjoyed all that. And then I guess lastly, now a, a lot of those, those friends are contributing to the anthology, which, you know, I, I have high hopes for, because if we're all marketing it and I, I believe that'll get a lot of new eyes on everybody's work. Mm -hmm. And um, and anthologies, you know, a zillion novels are released every day, but only so many, you know, anthologies. So it's a little easier to uh, gain momentum and stand out, and 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 end up with Amazon helping you market your book. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fingers crossed. I'm really, really hoping that because for the last couple of years I haven't done much marketing. I've done way more marketing for the shows than for my writing. And I, and I, I want to get back to that, you know, and, and while I write for myself and for fun, I still would like people to read it, you know, and sure. out of the 8 billion people on the planet, not a great percentage of them have read my books. Well, <laughs> not even a billion Bastards. people have read them. I know. <laughs> so, so I very much, it, you know, I mean, the stuff I write isn't for everybody. I mean, yeah. nothing that anybody nothing. writes is for everybody yeah. except, I mean, even Stephen King, where it's for almost everybody. It's still yeah. not for everybody. But my stuff's really not for everybody. And so I got to find the, the people who would be interested or who would enjoy what I write. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the trick for indie authors, yeah. you know. Nice. So for those people who might be interested after hearing this conversation, Tell everybody where they can find where you're going to be working, where they, where they can get your work. 
Well, my books are on Amazon. Uh, they're all in Kindle Unlimited, and and uh, if you you can go to my website, Cataldi.com, and and get more information on that and links and stuff. But uh, yeah, Amazon. Yes. There's not a lot of Ron L. R. authors on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, just one. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're pretty easy to find on Amazon, for, which yeah. is a godsend, you know. But yes, <laughs> but we've reached the hour, my friend. Um, this was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, pick your brain about what you do because we we don't get to talk about that very often, and I really appreciate that. So, well, thank you so much. It was, of course. Well, it's always a joy to talk with you. We we have a lot of fun talking together. Mm -hmm. um, but this was a, another enjoyable conversation. So thank awesome. you. Awesome. And it, everybody, just remember that it's always time to go in now. And we'll see you again soon. So take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.